fastest Indian in the world. He's got a need for speed and he made history in Indian motorsports when uh, he became India's first Formula One driver, Narain Karthikeyan. Failure in this sport is almost the cost of your life. Most of the series, there's at least one or two crashes. You know, this thing is traveling at 300 kilometers an hour. No matter how safe these cars become, it will eventually take lives and you get hurt seriously. To achieve something in this game, you have to take a chance with something in the boundary of disaster. How do you win and perhaps survive? Super Formula are the second fastest single-seater racing series in the world. I was driving with the Toyota engine car and then the tire pressure was low in a quali lap. I lost it in a corner which should have been easily flat out and then that pitched me to the wall and the helmet cracked. I had a lot of pain in my chest and then I realized then something was broken. How many times you had to talk to your family to say that I'll come back alive Hi, welcome to The Other Side. I'm your host, Dilip, an entrepreneur and an endurance athlete. In this podcast, we will explore the experiences of high-performing individuals while unpacking their mental and physical fitness routines that took them to where they are. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Narayan Karthikeyan. Autosports calls him the fastest Indian in the world. He was the first Indian driver at Formula 1. He was the first Indian to win the British Formula Winter Series and the Formula Asia in 2000. He's a Padma Bhushan Award winner. Narain really put India on the global map for motorsports. There's a lot to explore and unpack his other side. Let's get to the podcast. Narain, thank you very much for taking time. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get on to it. Uh, Narain, Ernest Hemingway once said that uh, motor racing bullfighting and mountaineering. These are the only three sports, rest are all games. You've been in one of it for 30 years. What do you think of it? Of course, uh, motor racing is a very uh, exciting sport, very dangerous one as well. Uh, the rewards are great. Um, likewise, you can have a lot of uh, external factors will determine the results. The car you drive in Formula One largely you know, is very, one of the most crucial factors. But um, for me, the the biggest challenge was, you know, uh, trying to break through from India to get onto the world stage, early 90s. Yeah. Quite tough. Yeah. Yeah. Let's trail back to your early childhoods, right? You were born in a pretty much sporting family. Your father, Mr. G.R. Karthikin, has been a national level rallyist for almost seven years. Um, how did a young child get in that obsession of speed and racing? Well, I'm from Coimbatore and um, in the 80s, engineering was, uh, you know, so we were very good at in Coimbatore. The foundries, the engineering uh, shops and, uh, um, you know, there, were, there are still a lot of engineering colleges. Um, so people messed around with their cars. Um, my dad used to rally. Grew up in, the, in a sort of a exposed to uh, these kind of uh, activities very early on. So I think this caught on the, the focus, but I really didn't think much of Formula One until, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. Um, and then the I started to follow Formula One from India was quite tough because you had, you know, you had Doordarshan and nothing else. Um, so uh, people used to send me recorded VHS or uh, cassettes from the UK. My relatives used, used to live there. So it all kind of you know became more and more serious just the passion and saying okay as a child uh, let's give a, let's be India's first Formula 1 driver you, you know you can say those things when you're 10, 11 years old I want to get back on that but uh, tell me your father was a rally driver and you were a single seater uh, how did you make that choice? yeah two very different disciplines uh, but um, I suppose I didn't like the dust and the <laughs> And getting, you know, these rough terrains and uh, and Formula One is uh, was a very exciting sport to watch on TV. So um, I suppose that that made me possibly shift. So let's go back. In 1992, you're a 15 year old. You come back to the Sri Perumbudur track. You're at your first debut race, the Formula Maruti. 
and you win the race, right? On your debut, what was in your mind to give you that confidence that you're going to win that debut race? Uh, so those days there was this the only uh, category series of uh, in India was the was the single seater cars made with the 800 cc Maruti engine. Um, and it used to have a strong grid. All the top Indian drivers had to drive this uh, series. Um, but I knew I was quite good because uh, by this time I had already gone to uh, the racing school yeah. in France, the Winfield Racing yeah. School. A lot of F1 graduates, world champions have been through the school. And um, I kind of got a... Uh, the first time I went, I knew I was that or that about with the Europeans and then I won the competition the next time um, so I kind of knew that you know I would be uh, quite up the field but um, I, I think the second corner I was leading the race uh, I actually didn't win that race uh, The we had a mechanical issue with the car I was leading the race and then I had to retire but um, but uh, yeah 14 year old you know, coming there and uh, being right at, at the top end of the game was quite, quite, uh, quite a confidence booster. Yeah. But I knew India was uh, not even a, wasn't recognized as, at all in, yeah. in the world. Um, but um, it was a start, nevertheless. Yeah. No, but at that age, fourteen, fifteen, you said um, you made a decision, and your family made a decision to send you to France to the Winfield uh, Racing yeah. School. Uh, What's usually the conversation at that time that you're choosing to pursue uh, education in a very professional sport, which is unheard for most? In today's era, you have an internet, you have tons of sites, you have communities to talk to. You're talking about an year where internet penetration yeah. itself was not there. Right? How are you making those decisions? What made you choose that particular school? Um, firstly, you know, you can imagine, as you rightly said, 1992 to say, um, that I want to be a racing driver <laughs> was a um, brave decision <laughs> and um, my parents backing this up was uh, even braver uh, but um, I think I think they saw the passion in me um, my father obviously was interested in cars and we had a subscription of uh, the car and driver magazine from the US so it used typically used to arrive a month later and then there was an article about this Winfield Racing School in France. That's how we got to know about this. And then you send off your shoot off faxes and, you know, those. that was the communication those days. But, um, yeah, absolutely so thankful to my parents because they kind of at least had the vision to um, say, OK, let him go to the racing school in Europe. He will see the competition and he will know it's not a sport for the Indians and then come back. Thankfully, uh, it, it played out a little bit different. Of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, it helped India get its first Formula 1 driver. Absolutely. For a 15-year-old, when he's getting into a racing academy, uh, what's typically the curriculum? What's ahead of them? What are they learning uh, in whatever year to year they have to graduate? What do they come out with? So, you come out with better race craft, um, better technical know-how of the car in terms of a race car. You can get a lot in terms of setup, setting up the way you want the car to drive. Um, you obviously learn a lot on the correct racing lines. Um, so these are the basics which you learn. Uh, so normally you go to a racing school when you do maybe five, six, seven years of go-karting. Okay. And then you go to the racing school, it's natural. You you relate to it quite uh, e a lot easier. Um, I, I'm sure anyone can enroll themselves into a uh, racing academy but going to the next level of course they have a lot of filters um, so as I told you seven eight years of karting behind ah. you would help a lot but I didn't have this exposure um, what I had was uh, you know driving around whatever I could get my hands on tractors to uh, bikes I started off riding you know these um, um, off-road bikes when I was nine years old so Everything helped, I suppose. And then the interest and you read books and um, I was outstanding outside the classrooms. So I, the the only thing I was reading was all motorsport related uh, books, which were informative. And um, so I kind of um, I never doubted myself, always confident. And it was when I 
went to the school it was only all europeans and americans and, yeah. but um a little bit you know i was the youngest uh, they were all a little bit older um but it didn't intimidate me or, or i didn't feel that i'm you know anywhere before you made a choice to go to uh france for the racing school how much role did your dad play in helping you get to the basics and the technicals i think the basics he was involved for sure um, but uh he never pushed me to you know to uh, take ra- uh, you know go see rally so or race in fact there were races in cholavaram uh, in in chennai which was a uh, you know once in a year kind of a event and i i remember very uh clearly that i went to one or two of those races so nobody was kind of you know uh asking me to watch this or do that so uh once you came out of the racing school uh you started pursuing your professional career you went to uk you 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 got yourself into your first uh british open uh series you also came reasonably good in the position you were i think fourth uh, there right i don't know how many asians were there uh extremely competitive environment uh what was your manifestation there just to survive or perhaps uh win to the podium positions i never knew what it's going to be like but i knew who i wanted to get to formula 1 had to race in europe in particular in england all the the great late atens and uh, you take now uh, you know nelson pk uh, uh, most rubens barrichello all of them went to the uk to do their junior level racing right formula ford formula 3 and so on um so i knew i had to go there and i had i was so happy and grateful to have the opportunity to even do a few races in england um so of course when i went there it was an eye opener because the competition was very tough they had by this time 10 years of go karting experience behind them they were also similar age 15 16 year olds um and they knew the the circuits quite well because they had you know grown up there um and um again as you rightly said in terms of uh, i never saw another indian in the circuit um were so, there any asians um very few there were there was a japanese driver and that's it you know and um japan has a huge culture of motorsport for for nearly you know 50 years um so um yeah it was very tough very tough in in terms of people you know didn't uh, i'm sure when the other teams thought what is this guy doing in this um you know this environment but so I had to you know fight your way through um uh, wasn't easy the weather was always so cold um you know you were living uh, first for the first time you were living away from the family um you know moving with the team in the transporter and because it's such a expensive sport we i had a um, jk tire as one of my first sponsor so whatever sponsorship we could kind of get our hands on you know that it helped to do i think two or three races the first year the championship was of uh, 18 races i kind of knew this is how it, tough it's going to be yeah. um so it kind of built me up mentally even stronger um did i go set the world uh, alight by my pace no not at all because it you can't just like uh, an professional level of any sport you can't just go turn up there and without practice without knowing you know the the way things are done you, it's not possible yeah but then i came back um then we had thankfully the tata group supported me we had more more budget we had we could go and practice more and then i was you know practice makes yeah. perfect in any sport yeah. i'm sure that experience of pitching tata in sponsorship now helps you as you are an entrepreneur you must be pitching to investors but going back to that moment um you said in the past that you never had a plan b yeah. at that age it's it's one thing that you can get aspired by seeing someone but in your case there was no aspiration there was no indian there was no one around you yeah. right uh how do you manifest that goal i don't know just being um, you know silly about it stupid about it saying yeah i'm going to one day you know be a formula 1 driver but um i just never gave up no I never took no for an answer um and um thankfully 
as i told you when i went back uh, i had the results as well so uh, when you when you look back what what do you think didn't really uh, do good to you so f- the first year i drove in formula 3 went to a very um, uh, one car team but they were, had two drivers but it was only they, uh, they used to you know, concentrate in this single car effort for a british driver um so i didn't have you know these managers who could tell me what you know how to structure this entire um you know signing up with the teams and the delivery bills um so that was a big lesson as soon as i changed teams um carl and motorsport one of the most yeah. successful teams in in the world now in junior single seater we started winning races uh pole positions lap records um so uh it played a important role in terms of your mental fitness where you know they were batting for you uh versus you know you were put in a corner just you know give you uh fuel and say get on with it that was the biggest difference in 2005 you became the first indian you did your debut in formula 1 i think it was australian uh, yep. series right uh, um and my debut race in 2005 qualified 11th on the grid yeah um in the wet in wet conditions um so we had the bridgestone tires versus the other most of the other teams barring ferrari had the michelin tires and in wet weather our tires were better and so you know i qualified a very strong 11th position and and um, you know i think uh, you know schumacher was in 15th um so it was a mixed condition in the wet and wet weather but i made the most out of it and made people sit up and notice in the press conference somebody asked schumacher what do you think of this rookie and he looked at me and said you know it's a great job and you know you had to pinch yourself yeah um you know you're you're sharing uh, this um, press conference with the he was already seven time world champion then yeah um so i mean that that was the best thing that could have happened you know endorsement from michael of yeah. course yeah but tell me i mean that year was also great but also it didn't turn out as great as one could have anticipated you know just before just beginning of 2006 uh, the chinese grand prix uh, you know your car crashed uh, and then there were a lot of distraction the team management came asked you certain fee to pay and uh, uh, what was going in your mind i mean that's not ideally a frame of mind what a driver should go through because you are focusing on performance but now your team management is coming after you and asking for damages right how did you get out of that situation so normally a midfield or a back marker team towards the back of the grid team don't have enough sponsorship so to buy the equipment to in order for the r&d to happen they lean on the drivers so be it fernando alonso uh, michael schumacher was backed by mercedes in his debut um all most of the drivers so i was backed by the tata group so we had a limited budget it cost millions of dollars and yeah. those days it was uh, of course yeah uh, of course it made a lot of uh, headline uh, headlines in the in the newspapers and we had got a lot of publicity a lot of interest but then the amount you know when you and uh, convert the 60 rupees to a pound or whatever that it was then it was a very expensive proposition and um, you could get a lot more uh, uh, return on uh, you know cricket or whatever bollywood or whatever but um, tata uh, mr tata himself um, you know made sure that this went through um, the sponsorship from tata group and tata motors was a very important part to have produced india's first formula 1 driver and um, and mr tata was there at the bahrain grand prix with me supporting me so you know this was the best thing that could have happened as a rookie made lot of mistakes uh, but uh, i wasn't fit enough uh, that was a big kind of um, um the negative point um because i did not know what again nobody advised me that how tough it that it's going to be very tough physically and mentally even more tougher um so these two aspects i could have you know seeing back i could have maybe done better but um, at that point of time i was at the best i could do yeah but uh, in 2006 you chose uh, not to pursue 
being a race driver, you moved in to be a test driver for uh, Williams, right? Uh, was having no sponsorship a primary reason or a combination of fitness and other factors made you choose to be a I, test driver? I think you needed a, a lot of support to continue with Jordan in terms of sponsorship. And there was the, the this Dutch driver and the Portuguese driver who was my teammate the previous year in 2005. The government uh, backed them massively. So they had um, north of $10 million of support um, and, you know, we could, doesn't matter which group supported you at that point, was a lot of sponsorship to find. Of course, in India at that time, there was little support from the government. In fact, motorsport was not recognized uh, as a sport until 2014. Um, and um, this changed when I, you know, received my Padma Shri Award in 2010. So the outlook was very different then yeah. to what it is now. Um, so I couldn't stay in the, on the grid. So the next best opportunity was, I thought, um, was the Williams F1 team. Huge pedigree, lot of championships. And uh, I thought maybe you'd be the third driver, reserve driver that you, you'd get an opportunity the year after in 2007. But F1 doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Some At that time... A uh, Japanese driver, Kazuki Nakajima, had the backing of uh, Toyota. So he brought engines and gearboxes. So my drive, I couldn't get the drive. Instead, it went to him. So, um, it's and I had an offer to be a test driver with Red Bull, but they were in the first year of uh, comp competing in F1. Helmut Marko uh, used to support me. I was a Red Bull driver in 2004. I, could, I should have taken that drive, but... You know, you can sit here today and think of all the things you could have, but, but that's I mean, the way it is. At that moment, how are you making these decisions, right? I mean, you had an option to go to Red Bull, you were in Williams. Uh, I don't know if you could just probably go and knock a few more doors of corporates. Maybe you could have got enough sponsorships to go back and still be a race driver. Trust me, how I tried a lot. <laughs> I went to every corporate there is. But, uh, but uh, even though the exposure was quite phenomenal, uh, it was very tough when you spoke about millions of dollars and they, when they converted it into rupees. And I, know. It, it, I was like, wow, that doesn't make sense. Although, you know, history is that you came back to F1 later with HRT. But at that time, 2007, 2008, you have a choice, you're being a test driver. Uh, what are you now still pursuing? Because you know your racing driving is perhaps not as a priority and you're becoming a test driver right now, right? What is anchoring you? Is it that I mean, because now you are getting paid being a test driver. Is that the anchor or just being around the grid yeah, is the anchor? I think partly I just wanted to stay in Formula One. Um, uh, I could have I had an IndyCar test in America. Could could have taken that option, but the thing was I I, I felt it was unfinished business. And um, with Williams, um, I did lots of miles, lots of testing. You were driving at, at that time. Williams was still one of the top teams, so you were driving the one of the best uh, cars in formula 1 uh, but um, but then circumstances changed end of 2006 i i thought i was did the right move and i was extremely happy you had a very good relationship with uh, sir frank williams the owner of williams um, uh, and everyone else patrick had um, all the support system was there um, i was uh, so i was uh, the main Two drivers were Nico Rosberg and Mark Weber, and I was the test driver, and there was Wurtz, who was another test driver. So I was um, most of the in many practices, where, which I went head to head with them. Um, you know, I was quite competitive. Uh, sometimes in in Jerez, I remember over three days I was faster than these guys, but. Um, it was not to be. It was not meant that I drove there with them in 2007. You made a lot of, uh, you know, you were dwindling between Formula 1, A1 GP, NASCAR, then came back to Formula 1. Although these are motorsports, but at very different level, these are very different sports in itself, right? Yeah. Very different tactics. At that moment of time, uh, you know, what factors are you evaluating to make these shifts? So you don't want to be a test driver, right? And just go pounding around circuits, developing the car. You want to have your racecraft sharp, uh, sharp as well. You have to be sharp, supposing the main drivers got injured, you would, they would throw you into the deep end. So at the, you can't say I'm rusty, I didn't drive for a year. So I had to take 
A1GP. It was a great concept. Uh, country versus country, I represented India. Um, and um, spec cars, all cars were equal. Yeah. So I went there and I immediately felt I could win races. Uh, I won in England, I won in China. And um, I kind of uh, kept me my name up there uh, in terms of, and then uh, as I told you, racecraft was something which you don't want to get rusty. Um, just then simulators had started arriving, uh, quite sophisticated in those days. Um, and I did a lot of sim work with Williams. So it was becoming more sim work, you know, sim development, uh, which was, you know, was quite tough. So I had a, a, an opening to do races in a world class level. So I did A1 GP. So that shift between different uh, motorsports, uh, the drive was there because of the competitive spirits or I'm all here. So I as well just hang around. Um, I think both, bit of both. The I wanted to drive anything that I could get my hands on in a in a global stage. So I drove the 24 hours of Lemo, A1 GP, um, you know, IndyCar testing. So, um, you know, I just wanted to keep driving things and I always thought this will open up to, you know, again, a Formula One seat. But um, these disciplines, you got paid to drive. So you got into a happy little environment where, you know, everything is taken care of. And then, um, um, and then you know, I was ha quite happy doing what I was doing. NASCAR opportunity came up in America, but it was like playing shuttle and tennis. That was the, the difference, yeah. right? Yeah. The cars were ancient. Yeah. Um, technology was from the 1950s. Yeah. Um, so, but... I enjoyed driving that, you know, it was a different challenge. Um, you know, you had 50 year old drivers who were twice as heavy as you uh, coming in. Set truck drivers. Yeah, NASCAR and beating you massively because of the technique and the way, you know, they adapted to things. And um, from the outside, it's quite easy to keep, you know, going, turning left on ovals. But uh, technically, it's quite, quite tough. Um, yeah. yeah. Would you be... Uh I mean, I'm guessing, would you be a, of that era the most versatile driver? Because I can't think of anyone who has probably uh, showed up in a grid in such versatiles like NASCAR, Super League Series, A1 GP, Le Mans. Uh, do you think of, of that era, you possibly would have been the most versatile driver? Um, yeah, possibly. But um, I drove a lot of single-seaters formula cars until 2019 was uh, possibly the only year I dedicated myself to the GT series, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, quite versatile, you know, different driving styles for each of the categories, you had to adapt again, um, but it was quite fun, good fun, you know, you're driving all over the world. Yeah, I mean, a job which comes with a lot of thrills. 2011, you came back to Formula One, uh, you joined the HRT team. Uh, what triggered you to come back to HRT? I think that was a possibly a bad move, but uh, the Indian Grand Prix had just been announced. And, um, you know, um, I had to be there uh, for the Indian Grand Prix, you know, my home race. But there were no other teams out there. And uh, by this time, I think, you know, four or five years, you know, being just test driver and doing other series kind of, um, there was no, no, no seat available. Just the HRT seat was there. The worst car, the worst team I've ever driven for. Uh, but... Uh, people were good. It's just the 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 management, um, uh, the technicians, the engineers were fantastic. We didn't have very limited budget, but the top management were I don't know in which uh, uh, universe. Yeah, um, very tough. But what is it about HRT that has got the only two Indian drivers of Formula One, you and Karun? Uh, uh, is it something that Indians have only an option to get into HRT in this era or we are good to go beyond HRT? I think it's it's just that I was uh, unlucky um, in 2006. Yeah. Um, things would have been quite different if, if I got the Red Bull opportunity. But um, they were in the first year of Grand Prix racing as Red Bull. And I always thought Williams was the much better choice. The grass is greener on the other side always yeah but um um you know i i don't know i think karun had the 
possibly the push from FOM Formula One management to yeah. uh, take this only seat which was available. And um, you know he he didn't have much choices either. I suppose these, uh, uh, but certainly, I think in my case, it's just a uh, wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, if one has to look, a lot of motorsports enthusiasts, especially your fan, that's a common narrative that great talent, but with not a lot of options uh, and perhaps a wrong timing. And that's something which I often read in on the forums. Everyone talking about that. Uh, I want to talk about the World Championship Series. Um, uh, your manager then, Johan, yeah, uh, after your first leg, he said that you're going to win. Uh, how did he know that you're going to get through the World Championship Series? The the A1GP uh, World Cup of Motorsport yeah. uh, was designed to be like a spec series. As I told you, Formula 4, Formula 3, Formula 2, uh, they're all you know, spec series where you have the same equipment as your competitor. So, on a given day, um, you know, you have the opportunity to win. And um, on my day, I was untouchable in these series. I could win against uh, world champions like Jensen Button, Indy 500 winner, Takuma Sato who was my teammate. Um, so, um, and everyone knew on a, in a spec car series, I would win. So, it wasn't rocket science. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Senna once said that uh, motor racing can never be totally safe and uh, it should never be, uh, in his opinion. Absolutely. But do yeah. you agree to it? 100%. Why so? I mean, isn't isn't that a kind of morbid way to say I that? I think the, 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 you know, uh, possibly the, you push yourself to the limit and beyond and then there's a fine line. That's when, when you go beyond that fine line you get hurt um, and so you 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 know this thing is traveling at 300 kilometers an hour no matter how safe these cars become it will eventually um, take lives and and you know you get hurt seriously of course after uh, Senna uh, died things have become a lot more safer but then uh, quite recently uh, Jules Bianchi had a freak accident in in Formula 1 in the so-called very safe era and still uh, died uh, from this crash so it's uh, I think that um, I think that's how motorsport has always been it's been dangerous I think a lot of drivers get the thrill out of this uh, but um, yeah safety has come a long way since I you know even drove in Formula 1 it was quite safe then but now it's extremely safe you've seen the lot of crashes, high speed accidents these days. Uh, thankfully, the drivers are unhurt. But then in Formula 2, with the current, um, you know, safety cell and and your halo and everything else is still Huber, he passed away. Yeah. So it's never going to be safe. I mean, that's that's motor racing. Uh, you know, motor racing is also often you know, speculated as whether it should be uh, called as a sport or is it just an engineering showdown? Because it's it's not an equal playing field. Uh, like we were saying that, I mean, you always in your career didn't have the greatest access to a, a car, right? So on a given day, it could be a good athlete, but perhaps, uh, you know, unless you don't get a great uh, car, you're not going to win the, 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 the race, right? So... How much do you think that narrative holds still true? Uh, because it's not an equal playing field. Typically, a sport is where you have, you know, equal uh, teams and you're just going to compete and win. But here, you have access to great performance cars, better engineers, and then you have better odd chances, right? So, how much of that has changed in this era? The uh, the grid has become tighter. The difference between the top team and the bottom team is pretty close now. Um, but Formula One has always been that. That is a huge gaps between the top teams and the uh, midfield and you know you have two three categories the midfield and the back markers um, and um, you know Alonso would be a great uh, you know uh, example of he drove with uh, he was winning places with Ferrari then moved to McLaren with the Honda engine who were in the first year after a uh, 20 year absence or fifth, I mean 10 year absence in the sport and he was extremely you know uh, not competitive like 
you know, both two world champions, Jensen Button and um, Alonso, were, you know, in the back of the grid. So just to see, you know, how much the equipment makes, yeah. a, you know, the difference. Unfortunately, Formula One is that, and it is a huge R&D platform for manufacturers. Um, some of them pump in a lot of money. Thankfully, now there are budget caps. You can't spend more than 145 million. Um, so that's why the pack has become tighter. Um, and these rules were not, you know, when in my era of driving wasn't there. Toyota was spending close to one billion dollars a year on a two-car team. So can you imagine? Uh, and uh, and then there was uh, Jordan, which was like a very small operation. Um, yeah, so um, it is definitely a sport, but a business and an R and D platform. Um, one of the most physically demanding sports. Um, you you have to train a lot. You a lot of endurance training. Um, and when you drive the car itself, you become more race fit because the G forces you. Yeah. These days, you you have like you're pulling six positive Gs. That's more than a fighter jet. And a fighter jet, you have a G suit, and yeah. then you you pull till you know, nine positive Gs. But you are very very physically demanding, and the amount of training you need to do is incredible. You know, you have to eat right, sleep right, have a good fresh mental approach. Um, and be very physically fit. That's m one of the most important um, criteria of becoming a successful Grand Prix driver these days. Yeah, I want to talk about that because uh, I remember you had said this in the beginning that uh, in, in, in interviews earlier that you were not as fit as you ideally should have been in your early part of the career, what you could later be in 40. So we'll get to there. But tell me, 2014, you had a freak accident. Uh, which kept you away for a couple of years. How did that happen and how did you recover it from that? It kept me out for a couple of months. Um, um, I think in the, you're talking about the crash in Japan. Japan, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I got a nice opportunity to go drive with Toyota there in the beginning and then eventually changed to Honda. Um, and uh, in Super Formula, we, uh, you know, in qualifying, I just had this massive crash. Uh, Super Formula, uh, our car are the second fastest single-seater racing series in the world. Um, uh, massively backed by Honda and Toyota. I was driving with the Toyota engine car. And then, um, you know, just one of those things. I think the tire pressure was low in a quali lap. I lost it in a, in a corner which should have been easily flat out. And then that pitched me into the wall. And the helmet cracked. And that's how much I remember. And then I had a huge pain. A lot of pain in my chest and then I realized then something was broken and I could never recover from that accident because there were races. Yeah, you were every... not out from the season. You were still yeah, driving. I I'd still drove but then the recovery took a long time, um, nearly a year. Um, and But uh, that's how it is. Sometimes if you, um, you're not in a position to say, okay, you know, I'm injured. You don't want to say that to the team. You don't want them to get alternate. Either. You know, you don't want to be replaced or benched for injury. So you push you push along. You know, we were talking about, uh, you know, teams where the, the performance of the teams are shrinking now. The gap is shrinking. You have teams which are spending almost $500 million a year. Uh, why do you think Red Bull is unbeatable? I mean, for the past several few years now, uh, what's making them unbeatable? So... During the rule change, they had the best engineer and the best driver. And the platform they created was very good. And, and Max Verstappen, um, I think, uh, you know, has taken this equipment and made the, you made the most out of it and beyond. And is a very naturally gifted driver. So the combination is unbeatable. And, and this is how it will be until the new regulations um, come into force in 2026. I believe that they have a solid platform and and he's going to be pretty dominant. For a sport like this, so you have to spend considerable time with the engineers and the technicians, right? How in back day, back in those days for you and your peer, uh, how much of time they were spending, what were they spending time on how the, how the machines are getting built? So Formula One is a pinnacle of uh, sport and technology. You are exposed to cutting edge technology all the time. And a lot of aerospace technology is takeaways from yeah. Formula One. So, um, 
the cars were very sophisticated even in the early 90s. Uh, the 1993 season were one of the most sophisticated cars um, uh, ever built. They had four-wheel steering, they had two-way telemetry, which means they could, you know, all the parameters could be adjusted from the pit wall by the engineers. They had auto downshift and upshift uh, through GPS. Um, they had traction control. Um, they had every electronic gizmo you think of now was already that. 30 years ago um, and so it's always been you know uh, you're exposed to a lot of technology and uh, to understand this technology and to make this work for you is the challenge um, that possibly comes from the application of your understanding of this which uh, possibly I was uh, m reliant more on the talent than you know understanding this but uh, um, you know, we had all the tools, um, you know, for, for in, in, the, in a race, my tire would uh, degrade more than my teammates because of the driving style. Uh, but um, the year I drove in Formula One, the first year I drove, there were no, there were pit stops only for refueling. You had to use one set of tires for the entire race. Yeah. Yeah. So I had these big blisters on the tires because it overheated. And those those were the difficult times when I should have relied more on technology to you know, maximize um, and not have not let the blisters happen, which you know dips the the performance. Yeah. So these these things could have been dealt with better, right? And today it's much sophisticated. You know, someone in the grid is giving you signs. You have to come back. Uh, you have to change. Uh, but there are instances where you have to rely on your gut. So how do you, as a driver, how does someone train themselves when to rely on what? I think the feel. Feel and the experience, feel of the car and the experience will um, basically you get an idea or a sense of which direction it's moving, and if that is confirmed by the pit uh, for by your engineers technicians, then you're heading the right direction. If there is confusion, that that's when things start to get a little bit difficult. So, it, I mean, is that how you have to spend considerable amount time with the you know your team to bring that understanding, or does it really absolutely? Okay. You need to, you have lots of data in terms of what you can analyze and make it, you know, um, uh, make make the performance of the car better. But in many situations, um, we were, you know, at the limit, even though we had data, we couldn't go beyond what we were already at because there were, there was no resources or no, you know, solutions which costed a lot of, um, you know, a lot of money. Uh, so we were stuck in no man's land. That was, a, that's a, not a nice problem to have. You know what is wrong. You, the driver confirms it, data confirms it, but you don't have a solution. That's a very difficult position. So basically you can't close the feedback loop. You know you're stuck and you cannot move forward. Yeah, so I knew in, you know, from the HRT, we were missing 50 points of downforce, which is like four, Three, three seconds but, but you can't you, close you that can't, yeah. you can't do anything about it but in today's world I mean you, when I see you have almost 20 push buttons isn't that too much I mean a data point like I mean how, how no, is someone you, it's, it's uh, you have to get used to the steering this is multitasking and these systems were there 19 years ago when I you know um, started racing in Formula 1 so uh, I think Drivers' mindsets are, you know, wired for these kind of things. But at 300 kilometers, I have to go into yeah. different modes and sub modes, and to do the correction, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite challenging. And how do you train for that? I mean, what simulation do you bring in your training? So you have the exact all the, you know, now there are full 100% um, sims which are do exactly. You have the models which are exact correlation to the race car, right? So um, it's quite easy, much easier now because you do a couple of sim days and you get familiar with the steering um, and the function. So nowadays you do a lot of sim. There's not, not so much uh, on-track testing because of the testing ban to keep the cost low. Yeah. Because you have to operate within this $145 million. Yeah. Um, you can't afford to go test and testing is banned. Yeah. In-season testing is only a few nominated days by the 
by the organization. For all this cost which a company is bearing, there's also a cost which takes to build and prepare a race driver. <clears throat> and I was reading that it takes somewhere in the range of a million to two million dollar bare minimum to prepare someone from a young age to perhaps get to a uh, you know Formula One. I'm sure it should be much more than that. I think it's 20x that now. Wow. Yeah. And and you know go you know go karting probably should be at least a million dollar, right? Go karting. Uh, the basic go karting in Europe, the European Championship, you're looking at maybe two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars for a mediocre team, um, and um, upwards of three hundred for a good campaign. But this has come up. I'm sure you have fielded this umpteen times, but I can't resist but ask you again that: What will it take India to see another Formula One? I mean, we we have few. We have Jehan, a bunch of them, but. We are not a rich country, uh, right? And this kind of a massive money, which is not celebrated think, or seen. I think economically, we are one of the more fastest growing countries. The fastest growing country, of yeah. course. Faster than Japan, US, UK, yeah, China. We, we but, have more, you know, we have a lot of corporates who have a lot of, spend a lot of money in cricket and sport. That's the only sport in India, which is, which you can say, you know, pulls in the millions uh, or the billions of dollars. But um, um, I think exposure to any other sport um, to get the value for the dollars you spend, um, the return on investment. Yeah. How do you justify spending $20 million in a season of Formula One racing for an Indian driver versus the same in an IPL? I mean, there is no compare, right? I mean, there is... It's, uh, yeah, the my, gap is too different. But there's no comparison. But I'm just wondering, I mean, if this is a case where we have already had two Formula One drivers, right? So there is a certain bright future. There is a pedigree. There is a certain learning curve which is already built. Uh, why do you think now, even no, now... Uh, Kush Maini is currently competing in Formula Two. He's a very good driver. Um, even if he wins the Formula Two championship, which I hope he will, he would need another $20 million of backing for two consecutive years. Um, I, 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 this is a very difficult uh, uh, problem to have. Um, you may get the super license, you may be one of the best young drivers, but then the third problem, finding this kind of backing, is going to be, nothing is impossible, right? But very, very, very tough. Yeah. And the Chinese government has backed uh, Zhu, the Chinese driver, for the last three years. Year on year, you know, he gets a backing of, I don't know, the rumored $30 million a year. Um, and he's a, uh, Zhu is a good driver as well. He finished, uh, I think, second in the Formula 2 championship. So this is the kind of backing and support. But Formula 1 is, as I told you, is yeah. Formula 1, the global exposure. So corporates in India who want this global exposure and cricket is limited to the cricketing nations, here is the chance. But tell me, I mean, you, you meet a lot of young drivers now, right? And all of them is not, they're unaware. They are very well aware that this is a certain constraint or challenge which is ahead of them, which is beyond their talent. One is that you, you have no talent, but you're competing with others. Here, you have talent, there's not much of competition, but you don't have the backing. But I think it's just though, if they were the first Indians, then it would have been a different kind of uh, approach, I suppose, because maybe they would think it's impossible. Now, they have me, I've done 48 Grand Prix, Karun did a couple, I mean, he did, um, um, I think, more than 11 Grand Prix. So, there is hope. I mean, if we can do it, yeah. then kids will also think, you know, it is possible and it is possible. Now, what are you impossible. telling these young guys uh, who are still struggling to get the, uh, like Jehan or, uh, you know, Kush, uh, what is keeping them motivated today when they know they don't have the backing for the next two years to, you know, go to the I, I don't know if Jehan or Kush have the backing or they don't have the backing. They have certainly... Kush is certainly a very good driver. Jehan is a, also a very good driver. But um, um, to be a professional driver getting paid outside of Formula 1 for these two drivers, it, um, 
easy for them. They don't have to do anything else in their lives. They will be hired by, um, you know, the the factory teams in in Lemon or whichever other discipline. They will get paid, but it will never be Formula One. So their ultimate goal is to go to Formula One, and this is what it takes to go to Formula One. This is reality, and they have to deal with these realities. The Force India team happened. Um, were you involved in uh, building up the team? So, Force India, Jordan became Force India. Yeah. And of course, Vijay Malaya, uh, you know, backed it and bought it. But for some reason, uh, he was never interested in having Indian an drivers. Indian driver. Why so? I, I really, to this day, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure why, you know. Because they had drivers like uh, Luigi. Um, they were more Italian guys. Yeah. But you were at your peak. Absolutely. I was at my peak and, you know, I've driven with Luigi. I know his level. We drove in Formula 3. Um, definitely not slower for sure by any which way. So, uh, I'm massively surprised to this day that uh, uh, they didn't want me or nor Karun. Um, you should ask Vijay that. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's one of these mysteries, you know, an Indian driver in an Indian team with an Indian boss. Yeah. But it was a match made in heaven by that. It never happened. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Indian fans would have died to see that. But were there any attempts made on your part to find a way to get you onto the spot? Yeah, several times. Multiple times. Um, so, we reached out and the closest we got was to do a, simulate, uh, a simulation test in, um, which was sub, sub-pleased from McLaren. So we went to this fancy factory, did this sim, it's like a, you know, uh, high-end video game. And that was it. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 2012 Malaysian Grand Prix, a uh, funny incident happened where Sebastian Vettel, the Red Bull uh, uh, director, uh, both had a comment on you. You made a comment back. Um, how do you bounce back from such moments? I mean... Um, and I want to particularly be very curious about the mental strength what someone builds because you're not an European, you're not a South American, you're not an American, you're a rarely seen Indian brown skinned guy at a circuit like that. Absolutely. And it's in a way some kind of a bullying which is happening. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think it was bullying. It was uh, Sebastian being Sebastian. Um, you know, he always, you know, uh, complains a lot. But at the end of the day, he's a very talented driver. Uh, I had nothing to do with the incident. Uh, I was, uh, in fact, HRT had one of the best races, uh, you know, you know, ever. Uh, we were running in a uh, in tenth position when the when it was red flag. Um, in the wet, I was extremely fast, and uh, we if if the race had been cancelled, we would have yeah. got a uh, you know a point for tenth position. But but then. I think what happened was uh, I got onto the uh, to the curb and it was wet and I slid and he cut across and he he had a he you know crashed into me and but that's and he got pretty furious after that. You know, this is a sport where uh, sometimes I get a feel that um, the drivers' goals are always not related to a team's goal because they are very unrelated, right? So as an individual athlete, how do you do goal setting because you also have to align to your team's capability, your your management team's ability to support you for that. And you may want to be the best guy at the circuit, but maybe the resources do not allow you to do that. So how do you do goal setting uh, as an athlete? So, you know, you were, again, Malaysia 2012 downpour. Uh, I knew kind of the goal was to kind of stay out of trouble. And if I did that and the driving skills in the wet came naturally to me. I knew I would be in a good position. Um, so even with terrible equipment, the slowest car on the grid by a long way, you still had goals. You had goals to beat your Spanish teammate who was with you, Pedro Dolorosa, a very good guy. Um, had a lot of testing miles with McLaren. Um, very, um, you know, uh, accomplished racing driver. Um, so, you know, getting close to him or beating him was one of the other goals. So even with very bad equipment, you still have goals. You still are competing in Formula One. 
and you always have that hope of you know doing you know a few races where you will you know kind of stand out yeah yeah let's talk about physical training we spoke about it earlier now uh, you know usually uh, people speculate that formula 1 athletes are not as athletic as a footballer or a basketball or a track and field guy that's complete nonsense i know yeah. but therefore i want you to kind of uh, i mean uh, people who know the technical nuance would say that formula 1 athletes are perhaps one of the fittest you need to have an endurance of a marathon runner also need to have a strength uh, like any other sports so again you know different eras and so on but you what do you think of a cricketer you just stand there and you know knock a few balls you know right run around it's not like that anymore you know you they're also supremely fit i used to tra- train at the mrf pace foundation with cricketers in the mid 2000 2005 to 10 i would say i was fitter than most of them um but um, you know that was formula 1 then and formula 1 now is even more physical to drive so uh, fitness is the of primary importance for sure yeah you spoke about the 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 g force which is way beyond an imagination for a lot of people right uh, can you be very specific about what specific physical fitness training a certain motorsport driver especially even for formula 1 has to go through what's typically the routine so a lot of endurance work a lot of calisthenics with your own body weight you train pull ups push up a uh, lot of training for your core neck muscles um and generally upper body strength is something which you you want you don't want to be bulky but very strong a um, lot of light weight high repetitions um so yeah this is normally the routine and, and usually is there a difference between on season and off season training uh, off season you do a bit more weight you become a little bit put on a little bit weight and muscle basically and during the season because you keep driving you become race fit as well um the um so the the seats are molded for the race driver during the year it changes because the structure of the body becomes different your your collar size grows actually because your neck become muscular and uh so yeah it's a uh, fitness in formula 1 is you know you go to races like uh, singapore um bahrain um qatar they couldn't even get out of the car they were finished because of the high g loading and also the the heat um both of them you know together is a deadly combination and some of the drivers i think stroll couldn't get out if uh, some they were in the verge of complete exhaustion and um there was a call from the drivers to not have such physically demanding races uh because end of the day if you if for you knocked out unconscious at 300k it's very dangerous yeah. um and the extreme heat and the g forces of the nature of the track is very fast and flowing it got to everyone so physically they are as fit as any other athlete in the world yeah you said that in the past that you were not as fit as you should have been in the early part of your career as what you were in the latter part of your career What was that moment of realization where you feel that you were lacking the fitness? When I got into F1, I thought I was a long way behind because the cars were very demanding to drive. I couldn't drive more than five laps without a head support because the of the G forces, your neck muscles gave up, and the that is the first ten minutes of the day. You had Entirely. six hours to go, so you know it's un. You know anyone can drive a Formula One, but. to drive at uh, 90% or 100% they they won't last two laps because your the the biggest the uh, you need your very strong neck muscles to uh, you know to do all the activities to you know to coordinate to uh, see what is and you just can't drive them if you're not fit anymore the uh, formula 1 has always been like that and now so even more um, you know fitness has uh, become a primary goal um yeah back in your days how much of technology adoption was on your part to get your physical training up what what did you adopt to uh so technology at that point in time um we had uh, we had quite a few simulations uh, for 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 mental fitness um it was already quite well established 
um, the game changer was um, Michael Schumacher. He started training differently. He used technology to enhance his fitness. Um, so this was, uh, he knew that Senna was extremely fit. So he knew he had to be fitter than him to beat him. And that's what how Michael started to train. So um, they had science to help them. And this was the early 90s. So uh, Schumacher made his debut in 91. Um, so in 92, I think he had a lot of push from, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, from the frontier of science to get his fitness up. Is it because he had that advantage of being in a country, in a space which is technologically way more advanced or the team resources is allowing him to get there? I think um, um, the ability to train, have the right trainers, uh, for motorsport was uh, was quite um, uh, for him access was quite easy because Germany yeah being being part of the ecosystem was uh, you know would have been easier than the rest even for him you know Senna trained a lot uh, you can see the old videos he was extremely fit but this guy took it to a new level yeah what's what's your relationship with nutrition back in the days when you were racing I mean I've read typically a uh, driver depending on their body type might lose two to four percent of body fluid losing 1500 odd calories sometimes they may lose even five percent of their body weight yeah absolutely you have your heart rates at 175 plus um and for a uh, for a long period of time um you have a lot of um g-force and heat related uh, so you have to go through that thermal regulation yeah. yes we by the time i went it was all quite evolved uh, we had, um, you know, cool suits. We had uh, to bring down the core temperature. We had a lot of things. We had, we they always had uh, electrolytes through the through the helmet. So you know, it was quite advanced uh, by then. And until then, I had driven a maximum of uh, I think one hour races. And then suddenly you get here, and it's like double that. And you know, and from two G's you get into five G's so it was a huge difference how are you adapting to this versatile nutritional uh, uh, you know uh, food choices because from India having a very particular palate now you're in Europe and different parts of the world where you not just have to eat for survival but for performance yes. right so how easy or hard was it for you to adapt to those uh, being uh, you know from South India you tend to eat a lot of carbohydrates and that's a big no there straight away. It's, uh, uh, you know, the best you carbohydrates you get is the slow, slow release, yeah. you know, kind of uh, foods. Um, but then you start eating a lot, lot more protein. Um, so it was a protein rich diet. Um, and then, you know, uh, now uh, Lewis Hamilton is a vegan. Yeah. Um, so, you know, plant based uh, stuff. So obviously it's working quite well. Uh, so nutrition has they've come a long way they're very long way yeah how are you managing uh, travel I mean sleep quality has to be uh, up class and yeah. you're traveling all uh, every I was day. sleeping quite well until I started uh, I became an entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should talk about those protocols but at least during those days uh you were traveling almost every day, different continents, uh, different uh, times. Yeah, zones. but uh, travel is not like you don't get into a commercial plane and you had your private jets and, uh, um, you know, in, in Europe. Perks of Formula One. Yeah, perks of Formula One. Even smaller teams tend to have their own jets and, you know, you get, get from A to B very quickly. So nothing to complain. It was in the most luxurious way you could be transported. Uh, and you stayed in good hotels normally um, and you could train you could get your recovery massages done all of these things right so going through time zones was not the biggest factor it's just the um, I think the body when I mean, you travel so much it kind of sometimes goes off into a shutdown mode and you to minimize that is what you're looking for all the time so the recovery process you had your physio always with you traveling so, um, it wasn't nothing to complain of, quite enjoyable in fact. Uh, I want to talk about mental training, which is very critical for this sport, right? Sterling Moss 
uh, said this quote that to achieve something in this game, you have to uh, take a chance with something in the boundary of disaster. Uh, how do you extrapolate that uh, to a driver uh, whose goal is to win and perhaps you know survive? Uh, what would that mean to them? Well, I think mental health, mental fitness is, uh, you know, again, in our sport has come a long way. Um, the focus you need to achieve the results you want, um, I think is there is far greater emphasis on, em emphasis on uh, mental stability, fitness, all of these things. Again, they use m multi, you know, uh, platforms to get the driver into the zone um, of focus and and hence the you know the desired results also um, are you know um, are it's more kind of you train your mental fitness to a level where the desired results have become a lot more focused and a lot more easier. Yeah. The risk of failure in this sport is almost the cost of your life, right? Absolutely. So. Uh, so it has, I mean, is it like a, a good driver has to have an ingrained capability or ability to be fearless or is it a skill which can be developed over time? Got to be a little bit fearless, um, but then you have to respect the sport or it, it can bite you anytime, you know, and, and quite badly as well. Uh, but um, yeah, being completely fearless may, may not be the right uh, a right attitude, but um, yeah, you have to respect the sport a lot. But how do you train for that, Sal? I mean, you go in a crash. I mean, we see most of the series, there's at least one or two crashes, right? But then you have to build that mental stability to come back. And you said you were back uh, in few months and then you were racing, although you were not completely recovered, right? But that crash can be very fatal. Uh, crash can be, you know, can take, zap the confidence, can, you can have a, a disability, um, but um, um, Formula One technology, the cell, the carbon fiber cell and the and the, uh, the halo um, around it, I think is, uh, uh, it's become quite a good, you know, protected environment. You have race suits, which have, you know, the technology has come, um, you know, leaps and bounds over the last 10 years even, the they weigh, less than 800 grams and they have resistance of 30 seconds um, so you know all these factors Kev Kevlar composite helmets have always been there for for as long as I can remember but um, yeah I mean it is risky sport but um, you have to nowadays be very unlucky to get yourself killed I suppose yeah but in your back in the days when you were racing what was it like? How many times you had to talk to your family to say that I'm coming back and also calling you, uh, you know, I'll come back alive. I mean, because these are, I mean, you see these crashes and technology was not at that level what it was now. Uh, obviously, it was safe perhaps, but not at the level what it was now. How are you training along with your physical side of it to, you know, keep going back on it? So when you have a crash, uh, of course, you, if it is a mechanical failure, then the confidence the level comes down even further because you think that it can happen again. Again, yeah. But if it is like a mistake you did um, and then you crash, then you know you won't, you know, you won't possibly do that. Two different kinds of accidents normally. Um, and um, to recover from the mechanical failures is much more tough than the, the ones where you make mistakes and then you crash, then that's, you don't even think about that. No. You don't think about it, it just comes naturally. But the, the mechanical failures are the ones that get you. Yeah. So you'd go back and talk to engineers or you have psychologists, uh, you're working with some therapist to help you get down? Yeah, I, I didn't work with a psychologist in my, uh, you know, the stint in Formula One. Um, but I believe most of the drivers have one at this level. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, your sponsors, your anchor sponsor. You, we touched upon briefly Tata. Uh, how did you get them on board? What was your pitch when you met Mr. Ratan Tata? Well, I was um, um, met Mr. Tata in '98 for the first time. I just wrote to him saying that uh, here's the Indian driver, won the Asian Championship, 
Uh, at that time, I was sponsored by Philip Morris, Marlboro Cigarettes, but then uh, they didn't come into India. So I was suddenly left with no sponsors. And then uh, I wrote to him and then he was kind enough to ask me to meet Rajiv Dubey in Tata Motors, who was heading the passenger car vertical at that time. I remember this, I went and met him and he said, do you want to meet Mr. Tata for five minutes? I said, uh, are you serious, sir? Uh, he said, yeah. Then he called up and he said, okay, you know, you can you can meet him. And I met him. Uh, and I think that was 98. And they've been a sponsor until this day. I still work with Tata Motors. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I do a lot of development of their road cars. And again, this was an initiative by... Uh, Mr. Tata, he was in the board of Fiat and he saw Michael Schumacher helping develop the Fiat cars, the road cars, benchmarking them, giving them feedback. And um, I got a same role in 2006 and 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 I work uh, extensively with the Tata Motors and development of the road cars and a uh, lot of platforms uh, like the Safari um, and so on. Dynamically, I had a role to play in it. Let's talk about your new passion and your new livelihood. You're an entrepreneur now. Uh, a lot of parallels to what you were doing, at least some parallels to what you were doing earlier. Uh, tell me more about it. You're founder of DriveX. What does the company do? Why DriveX? Uh, simply because, you know, um, uh, you have a shelf life as an athlete and you need to do something else after that. Um, and I'm passionate about automotive. Um, COVID happened 2019, my last race in Japan, November, I won the race and then I had a contract for 2020. I couldn't go back to Japan. And then in 2021, there were a lot of young drivers who took my place and I couldn't, I wanted to do something else because it was nearly 27 years by the time I was being on the move all the time. And, um, you know, my son is growing up and uh, wanted to stay put in India. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, you, you know, I, like everyone else in India, you, your, your first way form of mobility is cycles and motorcycles. And the same with me. I was a good rider when I was a child. Um, and, uh, you know, we were thinking about the opportunities and the tailwinds of COVID. Personal mobility was something that was in everyone's mind. Um, so we got, we, we created a platform called DriveX and, um, we onboarded these pre-owned two wheeler, two wheelers. We refurbished them because my technical knowledge was quite good and put them back into circulation. Uh, so in a form it was, you know, uh, addressing the sustainability part in a, in a way we were out there giving people affordable mobility. And um, that was the concept really. And now it has grown to, um, um, you know, being the largest uh, organized pre-owned two-wheeler platform in India. But why two-wheeler? I mean, you are a four-wheeler guy for the longest of your time. Uh, what made you get back to two-wheeler? Uh, well, I was um, connected into the auto automotive ecosystem, knew all the manufacturers, um, Sudarshan Venu, Rajiv Bajaj are all known to me and I saw the opportunity in four wheelers where it was overcrowded by the time we decided to uh, get, you know, get into this, um, into this mobility platform. And um, so this was, it's a huge opportunity. The size of the market is very, very large. And my team, we eat, breathe and sleep automotive and we kind of, uh, you know, knew that this could be a, the right opportunity. And that's how we started this off. Yeah. You've been a great driver and I know Senna is one of your favorites. So Senna also said, I quote him, that if you don't go for the gap, you can never be a great driver. How much of that is relevant in entrepreneurship today? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of parallels between the sport I did and uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Yes, of course, uh, there was this opportunity, we grabbed it with both our hands and then, you know, we kind of, as a proof of concept, it started gaining a lot of traction. 
then we did a seed round then you know we did a series a round um and from doing like from retailing 30 vehicles we are at two and a half thousand vehicles a month now when i knew i'm going to talk to you one of the things which i was more excited was to connect these parallels because so much of these facets are relevant you have the team which you want you can't win a championship if you don't have a great Absolutely. team if you don't have a great car you can't and the same thing applies in entrepreneurship you need to have a great team you need to have a great product uh, and you as an individual need to be a class to perform but still there are bad days right uh, and you were saying uh, about the instances where you had to go and uh, make pitches so is pitching uh, and getting sponsorship uh, for your racing days as an athlete it's um, you know you had these blue chip companies backing you, Tata Motors, Tata Group. Um, so very early on in my career, um, I didn't have to do these many pitches. But here, um, I must have done, <laughs> I don't know, nearly 100 pitches. Uh, and you know how it is. Yeah. Um, so uh, sometimes you're frustrated, sometimes you, un you know, I've seen guys like, you know, not interested in the other end, and I'm like, hey, I'm not in here, you know, you're not. I'm the Formula One yeah, guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they're like, you know, but then, no. Uh, so those were all frustrations, and then I had to calm myself down, and this is the real world, right? And you're competing with thousands of other people who, are, who have great concepts, who are, who are, you know, pitching. So you have to be very clear in communicating what you want. They, you make it very simple so that the investor kind of understands where you're coming from. You know, un, your understanding of the business has to be top class. Um, so these were things which I learned. And of course, I understand it quite well. And uh, we got a seed round done in 2021 December, followed by a Series A round backed by TVS Motor Company in 22 October. Um, so we work with um, the big, um, you know, big manufacturers in uh, the two-wheeler manufacturers in India, and um, they back Drivex as a platform, and you know, uh, can uh, can be a pretty large business, I think. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about how this will pan out. You've taught millions of people in the country from your perseverance and your determination in sports. Uh, I'm sure that will come through in entrepreneurship. I have to say you are almost a fresh athlete here. You're, not, you're as fresh as it could be because like you said, you're competing with hundreds of other guys who are chasing the same money of the investors and yeah. selling to the same audience. Absolutely, yes, you're, you're right here. But uh, the advantage I have is the automotive ecosystem. Yeah. You know them, they know you. We, we are sh quite sure that we can take this to the next level, pan India, huge opportunities, two wheelers, you know how big it is in India. So yeah, yeah. India is a two wheeler market. Uh, I mean, it is not as uh, much a four wheeler market. So of course, there's a lot of opportunity. I want to shift gear with a lot of personal projects you do. You also have an NK Training Academy. Talk to me more about that. What do you do there? Why do kids come to you? So NK Racing Academy was uh, uh, kicked off in uh, 2005, 6, 2006. And we had um, uh, at that point in time, the objective was to develop the next set of young Indian drivers, give them the right exposure very early on after go-karting um, in single-seaters um, and then, you know, uh, get them to professional racing driver uh, in the world of motorsport. To, uh, for, so that was the initiative and um, we did that for four or five years. Uh, drivers like Aditya Patel, who's a... Uh, not only a successful driver, but has his own racing league, the Indian Racing League. He went through NK Racing Academy. And then I got back into Formula One. Um, focus, I said, I have to be there to, you know, um, you can't just endorse it and then not, not take care of it. That was very wrong. Um, so we stopped it for a while. Then 2021, 20, um, we started again. And now we do bits and pieces. Uh, I'm part of a, India's newest racetrack, the Coast Circuit um, and High Performance Testing Center in Coimbatore, which was recently built and um, which has been launched. So, you know, part of the design team, part of the 
the trust. So that's a nice way away from the business life. Yeah. What's your relationship being with Japan? You've had a love and hate relationship kind. You went early on. It didn't. You didn't get up to the liking. Uh, you went back and you caught to it like nothing else. So how did that relationship evolve? Yeah, early on, two thousand one, the I had to be in Europe to you know kind of be known to get to Formula One. So that wasn't. You were young and Formula Japan was a very alienated kind of um, environment for us. Uh, language was a big problem. The food was a big problem, but the racing was possibly the most competitive in, in compared to any other series. So I didn't really like to, you know, live in Japan for a long period of time. At in, uh, and I was twenty, twenty-two years old. Um, you're, by this time, I had raced four, five years in Europe, and you knew the system, and you knew that you had to keep racing in Europe in order to get a chance to get into F1. But 2014 was quite different. Um, I did Formula One, the, drove, um, you know, so many Grand Prix, 48 Grand Prix, and then I had, I wanted to keep racing in a very competitive series, and Japan welcomed me with open arms, and I possibly 2014 to 19, the five, six years I did was uh, one of the most enjoyable uh, time in my racing career. Japan, they're very passionate. Uh, they look after their athletes extremely well. Um, you have, you know, 10 different world-class circuit, law, huge crowds, um, over 100,000 people are in some of the races. Um, and you were a real superstar there. And uh, when you started doing well, winning, um, you know, Japan is uh, very... Extremely nice environment, racing environment. Yeah, you've you've raced all over, all disciplines, right? I mean, Formula One, A1 GP, NASCAR, Super League. Outside of Formula One, if I have to ask, which has been your most satisfying discipline as a career? Uh, I would say Japan was a great stint, and A1 GP that was more, you know, um, yeah. How can I say? Uh, it served its purpose at that time. Um, you were driving for your nation. That was a big um, plus point. You know, you, I had the 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 sporting blue with the Indian colors, um, which the cricket team uses. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, at that time, you know, came came out with a statement saying that you know uh, how well proud he is because a Indian at a world stage in motorsport is doing well. Um, so all these things kind of made it very uh, enjoyable and a lot of satisfaction, you know, when you hear the national anthem, um, you know, when uh, and on the top step of the podium. Which is still, as of today, your favorite track? My favorite track um, would be, not in any order, but uh, would be Silverstone, Macau, uh, Monaco, Suzuka. What about Brands Hatch? Yeah, well, I did a lot of winning in Brands Hatch. I thought it would yeah. be a favorite. And a um, lot of elevation changes, very narrow track, no margin for error. Um, you know, Senna, one of Senna's favorite circuits, um, mega circuit. You yeah. have to have a lot of courage, a lot of precision to be fast. And, you know, I always, whichever discipline I drove, I was competitive in that, yeah. in that layout. Yeah, let's talk about quickly the present and the future now, right? I mean, uh, Liberty Media Group, which owns Formula One, you know, their executive uh, came out in the press and said that they want to pivot Formula One from a motorsports to a media entertainment company. What do you think of that? I mean, how much would that you feel is good for the sport? The sporting element uh, has to be kept alive um, because it is a mega sport. Um, and uh, of course, from a you know, asking it to be like an entertainment kind of thing is possibly the offshoot because it is a thrilling sport. It is a glamorous sport and naturally it leans itself towards entertainment as well. So, but the sporting element should be the core. Did you see the Netflix series Drive to Survive? Yes, glimpses of it. Um, I mean, any part not, of what you saw, you thought, you think is overrated? Most of it. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it, but uh, 
but it's a, it's put together in different context but comes out as a nice uh, you know lots of masala and uh, entertainment to the core uh, formula 1 has become popular because yeah. of netflix uh, drive to survive in yeah. in usa now they have all, i think they will have four grand prix yeah yeah and how much does a typically a formula 1 driver earn in a year like any sport the top ones uh, you know they will earn on the highest but yeah. on an average how much does the league of the formula 1 guys are earning couple of million i'm sure yeah, yeah. because uh, west happen last i read earns roughly around 50 odd million dollars and other I think Hamilton more more yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, at one point of time i think michael schumacher uh, as a athlete he was the grossing the second highest ever yeah. nearly a billion dollars so. yeah who is your goat of racing of all time senna yeah i thought so why because i've never you know you've only seen him is this um you know mythical figure, figure yeah and um never seen him drive uh, only on tv and so on but as a personality he comes across like a very genuine you know from brazil um helped you know millions of kids get educated even after you know he started uh, very early on and the family has continued to do so the senna foundation even after his death millions of brazilian children have been given an opportunity by this foundation it all it all star was started by this great man yeah narain uh, it's been a super pleasure having you and having this conversation uh, you've been a you've been a torch bearer for the indian motorsport you put india on the world map you've been the greatest of all time for india uh, i want to ask is that a proud moment or also perhaps a disappointment because that means we haven't been able to create another talent yet uh i think it's only a matter of time um as i told you there is there are very talented individuals right now um i think kush is like extremely fast um and i hope that uh, you know in the next year or so he can do something in formula 1 yeah but um, of course you know as an individual my you know looking back at what what i've achieved was like uh, from the sahara desert trying to be a you know world class uh, skiing champion it's similar you know it's the infrastructure was non existent but never say never you always uh, you know fight and uh, uh, you need to dream big you need to be focused and if you keep doing all these things then yeah i'm sure there is always a light uh, at the end of the tunnel oh thank you that uh, i mean i don't think there's an apt way to end this that's a great final comments thank you narain it's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation and i hope people listening watching all this thing and got a lot of cues to go back and explore their other side and uh, learn a ton from you thank you thank you very much yeah pleasure it was so yeah uh, that was uh, narain kartikeyan you knew about him uh, today we perhaps knew a few more things if you like this conversation uh, do share it with your friends your family uh, thank you for watching and listening all through this uh, i'll see you next time uh, with another great athlete exploring the other side thank you